The Senate was in session this week for what we usually refer to as a lame duck session. But don't mistake it for a boring week in Washington. The president's former attorney pleaded guilty to lying to Congress. The Senate voted to end support for a U.S.-backed war in Yemen. We dove into a grim report on the impacts of climate change and more. Tonight, Senator Jeff Merkley joins us with his take on the week in Washington. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk. Hello to you and thanks for being with us. Welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Chris Willis in for Laurel Porter this week. It was yet another week where it seemed hard to keep up with the headlines. In just the last few days, for example, the president's former attorney pleaded guilty to lying to Congress and North American leaders signed a new trade deal. Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley has been watching it all as the Senate was in session this week. He's back from D.C. and joins us now on Straight Talk. Senator, welcome and thanks again for being oh, here. Oh, thank you so much. Great Always to good you. to see you. Let's start with right off the top. Robert Mueller's investigation led to another guilty plea this week. The president's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, admits to lying to Congress, pleads guilty. Uh, Cohen says he lied on behalf of President Trump. What does this plea tell you about where the Mueller investigation is going? Well, I hope it's getting close to the conclusion because it's so important that that material get to Congress so Congress can see exactly what's going on and the nation can start to uh, move forward. President called Cohen a liar after the plea, called him a weak person in that news conference. Are you concerned that Trump could try to shut down the special, special counsel's oh, work? Absolutely. Yeah. He has put in an acting attorney general that doesn't meet the constitutional requirement to have been confirmed by the, the Senate. And uh, he, this individual is somebody who has repeatedly attacked the Mueller investigation. And so this is an effort to uh, inter interfere with the gears of the system of justice. And we can't let that happen. Is it something we'll be watching closely as it continues, as this investigation continues and comes toward a conclusion? Yes, absolutely. Because under the current law, unless the attorney general acts, the, the Congress cannot get the report. And so this is why we're so concerned. And uh, certainly there's going to be a court case challenging the constitutionality. It's underway right now of the, the appointment. Yeah. Uh, but this needs, to move, this needs to move quickly. We need to make sure that in this nation where, in theory, no one is above the law, Mueller's report cannot not be torpedoed by the president. Okay, let's shift gears to Russia now. The president, of course, flew to Argentina this week, G20 summit, abruptly canceled a meeting he had planned with Russian President Vladimir Putin, citing Russia's seizure of the Ukrainian naval ships and, and some of the seamen. You had been very critical of Trump's meeting with Putin. Are you satisfied that he canceled? I am pleased he canceled. I'd called yeah. on him to cancel it. Uh, I proposed a resolution that said he should, couldn't do any more one-on-one -on -one meetings with foreign leaders without any of our rest of our executive team present. He came out of the Helsinki meet, meeting with Putin, almost in a hypnotized state, yeah. where he recited the talking points of the Russian leader. And uh, so uh, a grave concern to have uh, unmonitored meeting, especially when the president's under investigation for potential collusion with Russia. His unpredictability, he made that decision to cancel that meeting uh, on Air Force One, and, and it was made at the last minute. His news conference said he had planned to speak to him. Are, is there concern that, that they might get together while they're there and change minds? Well, I don't think that's going to happen. Here's, here's what, as I understand it, as he got onto the plane, he said he was going to hold the meeting. Yeah. And then Michael Cohen's announcement came out. And then within an hour later, he canceled the meeting with, with, with Putin. Yeah. And so because Michael Cohen's, well, statement had to do with Trump attempting to do a deal with Russia during the campaign, that seems to have been the trigger. Okay, let's talk NAFTA 2, also an, an issue going on in Argentina now. The new agreement, NAFTA 2.0, signed uh, at the G20 summit. You've said the new deal contains some improvements to stop NAFTA's ongoing job outsourcing, environmental damage, downward pressure on wages. You've talked about the need for swift and meaningful enforcements, provisions uh, for labor and environmental standards. Your words, this is a raw deal for Americans and American workers. What improvements need to be made in this? So the only real changes are a little bit of change on automobile work done in Mexico right. and a little tiny change on dairy standards for imports into Canada. Other than that, it's the same NAFTA agreement. So if you ask the question, is there anything in this that would prevent an Oregon company from going to Mexico? Any change from where we were before this was signed? 
The answer is no. We are still going to see the same dynamics at work that eviscerate manufacturing jobs here in the United States. So this is simply an AFTA 2.0. It's not improvement in any significant way, and we should torpedo it. How about split control of Congress? We've all watched the, the, the election in Congress, now in a lame duck session, but come January, Democrats will have control of the House. Republicans maintain, of course, control of the Senate. You'll still be in the minority party in the Senate. How do you think this new reality on Capitol Hill is going to play? Well, I'm hoping that the House will do the type of investigations that should have taken place previously. I hope they're going to take on the corruption of our Constitution, and by that I mean we're talking about the gerrymandering, mm -hmm. the voter suppression, and the dark money in campaigns. If we don't fix that, we are losing the vision of we the people government. I also hope we're going to see some collaboration. Yes for example, on infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, this is something that should have been done in 2017. Uh, the Republicans decided instead of investing America's resources in infrastructure, they did a tax bill that stole a trillion and a half dollars out of the Treasury and gave it to the richest Americans. I'm hoping we can reverse that and instead invest in the things that make families successful. Hoping is one thing, optimism is another. Yes. Are you optimistic that bipartisan work can get done here? Well, I think it has a better chance yeah. of getting done with the dynamic between the two chambers. Okay, well, I, I think a lot of people are hoping that. You might right, as well but, hope now, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Okay, shifting gears now to climate change. And it was just after Thanksgiving, federal government released that massive report on climate change and painted a pretty grim picture. The report says climate change is already impacting communities across the country and problems will become more severe in the future if you don't act. You've read the report. What was your biggest takeaway from this? Well, we see the impacts everywhere. We're seeing it in terms of the forest fires in the Northwest, the more powerful hurricanes in the, in the Southeast, uh, spreading Lyme disease in the Northeast, uh, more drought and more flash floods, damage in all kinds of ways. And the fact is those are the things happening now. What this report says is that if we don't dramatically curtail carbon pollution, these effects are going to get much, much worse in just a short period of time. One chapter of this report, report rather, specifically looked at the impact here in the Pacific Northwest. We've done stories about it this week. They talked about, it was two years ago, 2015, a particularly dry and warm year. Could happen more and more in the Northwest, this report indicates moving forward. We spoke, in fact, with one of the authors of the report about what 2015 looked like and the impact in Oregon. Let's listen to what he had to say and then we'll talk about it. In 2015, there was record low snowpack, which affected the ski industry, um, irrigated agriculture. We had low stream flows uh, and even some water shortages in, in places. Um, the low stream flow and high temperatures led to an algae outbreak in the Willamette River. Um, and then we had some fires, although they were worse in Washington that year than, than in Oregon. Uh, and there were also some coastal effects with, with uh, uh, unusual species being found in our waters and, and, and other challenges. So um, the, the uh, vivid example that 2015 provided of what the future might look like was, was a centerpiece of, of our chapter for this report. Okay, you've traveled around the state. You do it all the time. What do people tell you? What do you hear from folks about climate change and how these, it's impacted their lives? And let's talk specifically like the salmon run, the wildfire potential, Yes. yes. Uh, you know, our ski and outdoor um, industries, big impacts. Yes, all of the above. And certainly this used to be an issue that people said, well, is this just a kind of a think tank issue? Yeah. No, it's facts on the ground. It's affecting our agriculture, our forestry, it is affecting our fishing, and the reference to the small stream flows and the warmer water affecting the, the, the salmon, uh, certainly our, our winter sports industries, yeah. Yeah. all of this. But the biggest impact is the smoke during the summer. The smoke during the summer, the last two summers, has affected all kinds of outdoor activities and also things, for example, a furniture store owner said, I'm having trouble selling my furniture because there's a small trace of the smell of smoke. Yeah. People don't want to buy furniture with right. a trace of smoke. So it's a big impact on our economy and it's getting to the point where people are starting to say, should we go to Oregon during the summer because the last two summers weren't too good because of the smoke. That is a huge impact on our quality of life and on our economy. That report also says the evidence, quote, consistently points to human activity as the dominant cause of climate change. Do you think your fellow senators generally believe that assessment? Do they have an appetite to do something about it? Yes, but. Yeah. The but is that the Koch brothers, who are the biggest fossil fuel owners in America, are also the biggest funder of the Republican Party. So they will tell me, I understand there's a problem, but I don't feel comfortable speaking out because I may face a primary funded by the Koch brothers. Sure. 
And so this is the corruption of our, of our country by the Citizens United court decision that allows people like the Koch brothers who are worth more than $100 billion yeah. to be able to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to control the Senate. You had authored a resolution in support of these findings, and yet zero Republicans signed on. Why? Well, that's right. Why? Yeah, we'd... <laughs> you know, you, I mean, this I, is why. This yes. is why. It, it's, uh, it's fear of upsetting the Koch brothers yeah. and their associates. Uh, it's very... And, I must say, what we have to realize is that those first three words of our Constitution, we the people, that was the vision of distributed political power right. so that decisions would reflect the will of the people. And that's what Jefferson said was the magic of the Constitution. He called it the mother principle. Citizens United, which allows unlimited donations by mega billionaires, completely defeats that. It concentrates power. And that concentration, it gets worse over time. In fact, it's that concentration that led to the theft of the Supreme Court seat in 2017. It led to the legislation to try to undo health care for 30 million people. And it led to that trillion and a half dollar bank heist in the tax bill that enriched the richest Americans. That's what we're fighting against. Is there something that can be done about it? Is it a fight worth continuing? It is a fight. If we care about the vision of our democratic republic, yeah and it being a we the people vision, we have to fight really hard now because the further we get into this extreme imbalance in wealth, the more ways the 1% or the 0.1 of the 1% sure. have the ability to pull the levers of power. And so we are, we are at the moment where if we don't reverse, I'm very concerned about the future of our country. Final question on the climate change. President Trump several times the past week said he doesn't believe the climate report uh, that was released by his own administration. What's your reaction? Be, <laughs> I am, it, it did not surprise me. Yeah. He has been very consistent in dismissing this. He went and visited the areas that were burned in California, and instead of saying, well, this pattern, we right. can see because it's warmer, drier, hotter summers, he said instead, it's because we don't rake our force. Well, I'd be happy to give him a rake. He can rake all he wants, but as long as there's a hotter, drier, longer heat wave, yeah. we're going to have fiercer fires. He went down to look at the hurricane damage. And the damage is much more because of the ferocity of the storms that are pulling the, the energy out of the warmer ocean. But he doesn't make the connection. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he's intellectually best basically unable to make the connection or he is just so entrenched in his talking points that, that he feels comfortable misleading the nation. All right, let's shift gears to border and immigration. This is something in your trip to South Texas, I don't want to say sparked a lot of this, but brought a lot of attention that was needed in this. Immigration and border security continuing to be one of the most pressing issues in Washington. Uh, let's talk about what we saw last weekend down in Tijuana. Uh, a group of migrants rushing the border, U.S. agents firing tear gas to repel them. You said that was a disproportionate response, why? Well, let's realize first that the crisis is being manufactured by the Trump administration. There was the ability for people to apply for asylum, uh, for un unaccompanied minors to apply for asylum in their home country without coming to the border. There was a program for orderly treatment of signing people up for asylum hearings at the border, but I went down and I watched our border guards interrupting that process, blocking that process. And there was a program, the Family Case Management Program, that did a very good job of creating uh, high supervision and ensuring people showed up to their hearings, and the Trump administration dismantled that. So they have dismantled the key tools, and so helped create it. they were aiming to create a crisis at November 6th, as close as that as possible, and they succeeded. And, uh, but now they need to, they should have never shut down those programs. They need to reverse course, have an orderly process, and that way people can make their claim. Yeah. And realize, very few people who apply for asylum get it. Right. Only about one out of five, yeah. and maybe less. Uh, but, but a fair chance that's in our law, and that's in international law. On the other side of that coin with that, that issue of tear gas, do the U.S. border security officials have the right and the duty to protect people from rushing the border? If not tear gas, what tools would have been appropriate? Well, the key is to never create the crisis that puts it there in the first place. Your trip to South Texas, we talked about briefly as well. Is that something that you're thinking about uh, doing again? Is it, is it an, an issue in a place that you'll revisit? Well, I'm planning to go back down and visit the, uh, the family centers, and if I can possibly get permission, because I'm still being very hard, I want to go and see the, the, the children's camps. We, it's unbelievable, but we now have 14,000 children locked up, 14,000. That's uh, unbelievable. I would like to do a tour of those facilities. 
the administration is going to make that very difficult. Okay, we've got a lot more to get to in just a second, though. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in two minutes with more from Senator Jeff Markley. Stay there.